Hello, everyone. I hope you are fine. Um, it's me here, and I hope someone is listening to me or seeing me. Um, welcome to, to my studio. Matt, thank you for nice introduction. Uh, I would rather be in London, sharing the beautiful conference room together with all of you. But here we are, I'm in my studio, sharing the room with my friend, incandescent lamp that is symbolizing all of you. So I have a good fantasy and I can imagine all my friends from all around the world sharing this talk with me. Uh, I just introduced uh, my uh, talk uh, with a short video about my work Underworld. And I will take you through some of my projects that I did this year. And I, I hope uh, you can uh, get an idea and uh, enter my world of how I deal and how I work with the light. I see light as a, as a, a companion. Uh, we collaborate and for me it's very important that we understand each other. And that's how I use light as a tool to say something, to bring people into another world maybe, or just to open your fantasy as well as mine. Well, Underworld is a spatial installation in a form of luminous forms that was made for this island of light uh, event dedicated to the light art uh, in a little small uh, fishing uh, village called Smurgen on the west coast of Sweden. This is the, you see that nature is such a present in this place. And I went there to visit this place, to see what, what to do with this specific site. Architecture, this is fishing, fisherman village is um, situated in between those beautiful rocks. Sometimes, well, mostly hidden behind the rocks to be protected from the strong winds and the waves and the climate. It's a very picturesque place, very famous for these uh, uh, fishermen uh, huts, colorful ones uh, that are still in use. And also it's famous for this uh, long 600 meters long wharf. A few weeks every year in the summer months, this place is very fashionable. When the all luxurious yachts fill this uh, uh, inlet but otherwise it's very calm. And then the real fishing um, life exists as, as it existed before. The place was inhabited in uh, already in 16th century. And today it has just maybe less than 500 people living there. Well, I was very impressed with this place. And I went around meeting people and among all these nice, uh, interesting places, I met this fascinating place and these people. And this is Sixten, the gentleman to the right in red shirt. He didn't even want to be on the photo. He has this fantastic place where they work with the fishing gears and fishing nets. He's designing a special fishing uh, equipment for um, selective fishing, for example, for sustainable fishing. But he also has an amazing uh, initiative to clean the sea bottom of all the, yeah, the, the, the discarded fishing gears and the ghost nets. He created, uh, designed uh, special tools to make this. And they have these actions from time to time to, 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 to clean the sea bottom. Then they collect all this fishing nets and materials, and then se select them, different plastics in a, on a, each place uh, for the further recycling. Uh, fishing nets and the gears come from all over the Sweden, maybe even further, uh, to be taken care of here in this uh, place, in this marine recycling center. It was inspiring to think, to just to see what 
man has created to live on the sea. These are fishing nets to, to catch um, crayfish waiting here to be dismantled and recycled. This beautiful material, colorful material, is uh, very useful for, um, for fishermen and for people and, and uh, living at the oceans. But it's also a big danger to the sea life when it just flows around and kills everything that is on the sea bottom without any selection. It made me think a lot of uh, what is happening down in this world under. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of um, uh, Alex Raymond, for example. This is what I, I lived in this world in my youth, uh, imagining life on the different planets or under the sea. So this was a perfect uh, occasion also to dig down into the world of Coralia and follow Flash Gordon and his girlfriend Dale and Dr. Zarkov on their adventures under the sea. That made also um, imagine what is happening really under the sea and to make this connection and this passage uh, to the life under the sea. So I got some of these uh, nice, interesting materials and I borrowed one of the fishermen hats to, to um, experiment with the forms and materials and the with lights. I use disposed fishing materials that are collected from sea bottom to create the forms that will be a spatial installations that will depict an imaginary tiny undersea settlement with aim to put an attention in, into sensitive sea life and its fragile environment. The material showed to be very good to work in this um, uh, area because of its um, uh, transparency and also letting the wind through, because it's a very, very windy area. So these forms, I made like 40, 50 forms, 50 forms in different sizes um, to depict um, a fictional uh, civilization from world under. I gave few recognizable and familiar elements to this installation something like um, urban character of the, of the installation and a simple architecture, if I could say this is an architecture, like this is a little house, a hut, but it can also be imagined or um, uh, as, a, as a, a ghost or a, or a creature. The light bulb hanging inside, it's, uh, it symbolizes home. And now, We'll ask Dominic to play a video just to show you how these uh, creatures are also communicating with the nature. So this is um, this uh, underworld settlement placed here in a little alley in Smirkin. While I was setting up this uh, in, uh, installation, I met the neighbors from around who were telling me stories from their childhood. And I learned to know that this place, this used to be a canal. This old neighbor who was um, in the, one of these houses, he told me that as a kid, he used to swim there and they were using boats to, to uh, enter the houses, which I think it was even perfect for this um, underworld to rise here. The special soundscape uh, was composed by Argentinian musician, Lionel Kaplan, who combined uh, sea sounds, a life around sea and under the sea with the urban sounds. 
So entering this uh, underworld uh, world, one get the sound uh, from the from this uh, uh, imaginary um, uh, fantasy world mixed with a uh, with a real. So this summer, Underworld moved to Slovenia, to Ljubljana, for the Lighting Guerrilla Festival. Here, it was placed right in the heart of Ljubljana. And if you know Ljubljana, it has this famous um, Three Bridges Center by the famous architect Plechnik. And right there, we had these uh, clusters of Underworld um, placed on a, under the bridges and along the Ljubljana River. You can even come close to, to some of them. In August, middle of August this year, one of these uh, nice events that could happen this year was a blockade light, uh, light art event in the nature park blockade in Lower Austria. A small version of Underworld was placed there in these beautiful forests. And suddenly, even though the, the water was not in a close, but in this nature, the, this uh, Underworld got a different appearance. And I see here in background there are these magnificent rocks that look very much like uh, like uh, my shapes, my my light creatures. The event lasted for I think five days, and combined different light works around the, this nature park. Unfortunately, I was not able to travel there, it was impossible. And here we are now in uh, Skopje city park, during Skopje light, light Art District. And this is the place where video that you've seen previously was taken. In the city park, Underworld was placed along the canal Bigger version. Welcoming people to enter this world and imagine world under the water and hopefully getting inspired to take care of nature and this planet. I like working with the with the temporary light works. They are very I get in a situation where I can more experiment more. But I also like to work with the permanent light artworks that are integrated in the architecture. Especially in places that are not dedicated to art. Places such as uh, schools, uh, uh, kindergartens, nursery homes, hospitals train stations. This was um, a project for a new parking house, or actually a new hospital, in a university hospital in the city Arbro in Sweden. Two years ago, I was um, selected among a few artists to uh, make a proposal for the competition for the permanent light artwork that would be integrated in, a, in this uh, right uh, building in a parking house, in a stairwell of the parking house. I thought this building looks, looked very um, well, elegant to be a parking house. And it's a huge place and it takes a very dominant uh, place in the, in the cityscape. And this light work would be visible from far. As the hospitals are places 
where people usually don't go to to enjoy art, but they go with the usually very uh, uh, probably sad stories or uncomfortable stories. I wanted with this, with uh, my proposal, with my light work, to give a moment of um, relaxation. I wanted to make a moment of um, thoughts to go, uh, heavy thoughts to go away. A moment of breeze, of light. This is my first sketch, how to, how to make uh, a light movement through this uh, building. So I kept this image, I kept this focus to create a light work that would look like a fast drawn sketch. In January this year, uh, Breeze was uh, inaugurated, the whole parking house and the part of the hospital was uh, being completed. And here in the central part of this photo, you can see how it is uh, integrated in the, in the stairwell. It's on the seven levels of this, uh, of this building where one can observe work from afar. And it comes as a, as a uh, surprise. Uh, it comes, it goes through the building, down through the building, disappears. It's very soft and delicate dynamics. Based in Örebro in Sweden. And it's open for everyone. Well, I, as I intended to keep this um, uh, feeling of a, of a, of a fast uh, drone sketch. We made this uh, free bending line with integrated lighting on the seven levels. And each level has uh, its own form, but they are somehow connected together with each other. From uh, looking from the distance, the one can see this, uh, this line that that connects and the light goes through all the levels. But then when you come close to it, like here, um, experience of the light becomes much more intimate and impressive. It's a lot of um, silence in this work, but I can't show you so much of that because then it's no light. So I'm, sh I'm showing only the moments where the light and color is visible. So this is the seventh floor, the top floor. Going down, this is the, the level beneath. Here, uh, here is the, you know, the, when the, there is no light movement in the, in the forms. Then the light comes, goes through, disappears. It's a difficult work to, to document because the light the intensity is very low. Not enough. It's perfect to, to make um, to, to make the surface appear as a, a magical. And the next level, and the level beneath, and then the next level. I really like how when you come close and you re really go into this into this um, light and you lose this um, sense of uh, dimension, how light and color and the intensity of light uh, becomes uh, You always have a contact with the upper level or, or a lower level when you when you walk down the stairs or up the stairs. So that dynamic also was um, I was thinking of that when you walk on the stairs, what one, what you experience.
The scale of it, just to show you here, is on the ground level. It's quite big. It's more than three meters big, this form. You can fit in, a, in a, this format. This is the entrance to the stairwell, to the staircase. And you know, in this, this year, in this time of Corona, and uh, when all the museums have been closed, this uh, parking house was open 24 hours, seven days a week, and anyone could enter and enjoy good light art. And I think this is really important to integrate art in places like this, in hospitals, in parking houses, in uh, public spaces where one can you know, have a moment of uh, another experience. Now I'll take you to transmission. Transmission was uh, it's a very dear project to me, made for the World Heritage Grimmington radio station. It's in the south of Sweden. Uh, it's this uh, amazing building. Oh, it's uh, well, it's quite simple, <laughs> but what? What is what's inside and what is um, in a void outside, it's very amazing. This Grimmerton radio station is the, uh, it's a museum today, but it's still, it's uh, also working as a, as a transmitter. It's an early long wave transatlant transatlantic wireless telegraphy station. It was built in 19... 124 and inaugurated that year in the presence of the King of Sweden. It is preserved as a historical site and is only remaining example of an early pre-electronic radio transmitter technology, which is called Alexanderson Alternator. This gentleman is Ernst Frederick Werner Alexanderson. Uh, he was an electrical engineer, Swedish-American, and he was, a, he was a pioneer in radio and television development. A man with a great fantasy who made wireless communication possible. This is his alternator that still exists in this, um, and is still in use, actually. And can you imagine what this place was what opportunity it gave in 1924. Today, we are all used to have this wireless communication, like we are communicating that way now. But in before 1924, it was impossible. But with this technology, suddenly, from Sweden, one could uh, reach uh, people in, uh, in America, in South America, in Asia, in Balkan, everywhere. This radio station is placed in a quiet countryside in, a, in the south of Sweden. The only thing that is uh, visible are those six uh, magnificent towers, which together with the underground uh, network uh, creates a huge antenna of uh, kilometer, two kilometers big. That was transmitting. That is transmitting the messages using a Morse code. Today, the, the landscape is more or less the same. There are cows, uh, sheep, um, pigs <laughs> living there. Not maybe they can hear those messages, but humans can't hear on this distance. And what I was impressed with this, um, um, this project, and it was a really a dream, a dream project for me. I was hoping really to win this competition. I wanted to make this uh, uh, invisible communication visible. So I made a, a, a proposal 
to use uh, a laser beams to visualize this invisible communication, to make a, a, a movement of light that is um, transmitting a message. Those beams uh, move into in, 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 with the help of two two laser projectors uh, in a linear line, or also as a wave. They speak the same language as the radio station communicates with, but they are translated into the light. So we, um, I used, um, I decided to use the, the, the messages that are based on UNESCO's work that encourages international peace universal respect for human rights, um, sustainable development, and so on. And I added a few of my own words, like love. <laughs> These are the words that are, that transmission is uh, transmitting. Peace, friendship, love, life, quality, diversity, science, Respect, culture, art, knowledge, education, environment, freedom of speech, human rights, college, social science, sustainable development, intercultural dialogue, This is an um, industrial monument, a heritage site, so non-intervention non is possible to do. But on the second tower, up on 127 meters, there is a platform, wooden platform, where it was possible to mount um, the, the projectors and right in the perfect angle. So we used this uh, little elevator from 1924 <laughs> that can take three people and it takes 13 minutes journey up on the next level and the, the world changes. The view is amazing and the climate is different. It's blowing all the time up there. And the elevators is possible to use only on a calm day when it's, there is no wind, at least on the, on the ground. So, uh, transmission was inaugurated on the 13th of February this year on International Radio Day, sending messages of love and hope and peace. It appears sporadically and it's visible over the night sky on a long distance, more than 40 kilometers. I can tell you that, um, and you probably know that making a permanent installation using lasers is very difficult. We had to get permission of Swedish radiation safety authorities to use um, uh, uh, lasers. But I was so lucky. I was so lucky the position of the, of the Grimmett and Radio station is just there, far from airports. So no planes are uh, flying over this area. And also because the beams uh, can't be directed into the sky. So they, can, they have to be directed a little slightly uh, to the earth uh, on the safe distance. Where it touches the earth, it has to be a very safe distance. And it, it does touch the, the ground on a distance where there are no houses. So all this was just perfect uh, and make it possible to make a transmission. And also, what uh, the good thing is that um, uh, Grimmaton radio station is placed very close to the sea, and it's very windy, so there are always some particles in the in the atmosphere that make beam, beams visible. Sometimes there is a overcast sky, sometimes there is a rain, clouds, 
So transmission is experienced differently every time. And it appears as a surprise. No one knows when. And also the, the messages are randomly chosen. It's also a work that is difficult to, to document. We spend the night taking long, long uh, exposure photos. Crazy. <laughs> This is also uh, south of Sweden, a beautiful place, famous for its sand dunes. Particularly this one is uh, man-made for a, a volleyball, I think. Um, there are others close to this uh, beautiful sea that are just made of, uh, with the help of wind and sand. So the place is famous for its sand dunes. It's called Aarhus. And it's ever-changing with help of wind. It's a very beautiful place. It's a nature park. Here is one of the dunes. You just make it fantasy. Explode. <laughs> I was uh, invited um, to, uh, for a competition uh, to make um, permanent artwork for a new school. It was going to be built here. I was very fascinated and inspired by this, by the place and its nature. This is the school that was in opened a, a week ago, and I created. My proposal was to make a, a, a big um, kinetic sculpture that would be. Um, a monument to the sand. So it's, by, it's, it's inspired by sand and the sand crystals and all this changing landscape and all these changing um, light conditions that um, are reflected from the sun, uh, from the quartz um, crystals. As you see, I won the competition, luckily, and I was able to create this work. It's a mobile five meters big. It's placed in this uh, school. It's called the Sona School. It's a very nice school. In a central position in the school. Just under generous skylight. So that was also an inspiration for me how to work with, with the surrounding in this uh, in, 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 in the office. I knew that play, the artwork will be placed under the skylight. And I understood how the sky is always changing because of the winds, the clouds coming, disappearing, rain comes, snow comes. So I really wanted to, to, to use this um, dynamic of, uh, of uh, light conditions uh, to have a communication through the artwork. So this work is uh, in collaboration with the daylight, but there are also some uh, uh, artificial light sources that give uh, li life in the in the dark uh, periods. Artwork is made of circular dichroic elements, which are based on a quartz model, one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms. As you see, there are just a few elements in this work combined in a very, very chaotic composition. Elements are placed on, a, uh, on a, uh, flexible rods, so there is always slight movement. And also, as observer move, moves around slightly, only just with a, with a little you know, difference, uh, the color of these elements are uh, changing. So sometimes it bright colors, sometimes it gets transparent, depending on the, on the angle of the light that touches the surface. 
And I think these joints that we made, there's so beautiful elements like a jewelry. This is the view from under when you sit on the on the this staircase that was meant also for gatherings. From different different views and angles. It's uh, always changing. It always looks different. So um, this was a sand. I hope uh, you will come and visit it. <laughs> um, I think I will end my my. Uh, uh, talk now and I hope someone is listening and maybe you have some question for me. Wow well thanks very much for that Alexandra that was a, um, a beautiful presentation with some absolutely amazing installations. Uh, we've had so many comments on the chat throughout the talk there's been loads of people checking in saying hello and they're really amazed by all of your artwork as well so uh, it's, it's great to see so many people interacting. Wow. Um, we've had a couple of questions come through for you. The first one, although on the question box it says it's from me, it's actually from my colleague Sarah. Uh, she asks about the first installation you talked about, Underworld. Uh, your reuse of the fishing nets was a beautiful way to use recycled materials in your installation. Uh, how important is it to you that artists consider using recycled materials? And does it play a part in your design thought process when creating other installations as well? First, I will put here my audience so that I really feel someone is listening <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I, I work with the, with the recycled materials and I think it's, it is very important to think of the, where we live and where we are and to, uh, the future of this planet and all the, I mean, what are we doing? We are responsible. Uh, and we as a light artist and, uh, are here maybe to inspire. And as a lighting designer, so we are here to take um, uh, 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 care and uh, uh, of uh, using the, the light in a, in the right way. So in my artworks, yes, I, I I mostly get inspired from the place, from the site from where I work from the history of people who are around, people who will use the place. And for, particularly for the underworld uh, work, it was, uh, it was um, Smurgen and the life in Smurgen and this uh, fantastic initiative that inspires me to, mm. to make this work. And I think it's, uh, it's a work that sends a message of, uh, of uh, um, taking care of uh, nature. Mm, sure. And uh, we had another question come through from Diana Joles, who um, says, your work has amazingly profound emotional impact through subtle effects. Uh, can you comment on your approach in relation to the ecological sense of your art? Mm. Well, um, hmm. well, it's a different approach when I work uh, with the te temporary installations or, uh, or permanent installations. I mean rather like to work less things, less materials, less electricity, less uh, of everything than more. Mm. Working for the permanent with the permanent uh, works that are integrating in architecture, especially in places that are not meant to be uh, places for art, uh, I like to share something with the people there. Mm. Uh, those those artworks, I, I'm, I'm glad that Diana uh, um, commented like that. I think it's important that they have uh, empathy. Um, to uh, I feel that I need to, that I want to share something with the with the people. I want to give uh, a moment of uh, you know, of a um, um, moment where you can maybe work within yourself or. A, of think of something something different than the, than a hard situation that are 
Mm, sure. So um, kind of following on from that, uh, you talked about how a lot of your sort of permanent installations are in places like schools and hospitals, places where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see artwork like this. Uh, why do you think it's, why is it of such importance to you to bring art to these areas? Oh, it's super important, really. Uh, I mean, uh, let's say schools. I, 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 I'm so glad for the kids that will go to this sauna school and have this artwork there, which can you know, trigger fantasy and uh, make them maybe ins- inspire them to, to create things themselves. I went to school, which was uh, yeah, a nice school, but far from art. Uh, I went to schools, buildings that looked like a prison, where I really need to dig into my fantasy world with the help of Alex Raymond and uh, Herman and, and other comic <laughs> artists. Um, so it is important, and especially it's important to put artworks, but good and, and um, uh, sensitive artworks in a places such as hospitals or nursery homes, where people with the, with the you know, problems or uh, in a in an old age can uh, enjoy enjoy uh, environment. Mm-hmm. I worked with uh, some projects with with um, patients that are suffering from Alzheimer, and that's use of light and uh, color. It's uh, it's really important, and it mm-hmm. makes life better. Sure. So uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We've probably got time for one more question. So um, this comes from Guy Kornetsky, who asks um, if you have any regular collaborators that you work with on your um, art pieces. I do, yes. Uh, I, ha- I work with, uh, with um, uh, different teams, depending on what I do. Some projects I can do myself, but most of the projects I need to have a collaboration. So I, I collaborate with programmers, with engineers, with um, video experts and... Mm, okay, great. I well, keep um, me away from the technology. I don't. I don't want to know too much. I want to you deal with the art it. side of it, and let someone yeah. else deal with the technology. Exactly. <laughs> okay, great. Well, um, I think that is probably about all the time that we have for you today. So, thanks again so much for taking the time to be with us and for answering our questions. It's been a really inspiring start to proceedings today. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much.